Two thoughts went through your mind just now. Admit it. The first one was, hey, that's not Steve. The second one was, maybe we'll get out early. Both of those would be correct, so. <laughs> uh, so I'm sitting in my office last week, and I get this text from Steve, and it says, hey, man, you ready to do your first sermon? And I'm like, well, no. <laughs> that was my first thought. I thought about it a little longer. And my second thought was no as well. <laughs> the idea of following Steve in a deep dive study into Ephesians is not my idea of joy in the pulpit. So uh, I texted him back and I said, hey man, can we talk about this? And being the kind, loving pastor that he is, he said, well, he didn't text me back. <laughs> he let me stew over it all day. And uh, I'm just kidding. Actually, I'm not. He, he didn't text me back. But he, he called me that night and he said, hey, man, I just want you to tell what you're passionate about. I want you to talk about evangelism and I want you to talk about this, this wonderful new ministry you're involved in and how you came to be involved in it. And I said, okay, I can do that. So kidding aside, I'm actually excited to be here this morning. Uh, but before I explain to you about who Bill Glass behind the walls is. No picture. There we go. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm not going to give you my whole life story, but uh, I, I would like to share a few things. I have one of those, I grew up in a Christian home testimonies. And if some of you know what that's like, and, and I guess maybe at times I felt that was a little boring. But over the, real, over the years, I realized that Christian home or not, my sins were enough to send me to hell just as fast as the blackest heart that ever walked this earth. I know uh, Peter said, uh, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I know many of you have seen this video I'm going to talk about here. Uh, I love hearing Alistair Begg tell the story of the thief on the cross. If you haven't seen it, look it up on, on YouTube and watch it. Uh, he's there, he's in heaven, and they ask him how he got there. And after much conversation, he says, I'm here because the man on the middle cross said I could come. What we learn from the thief on the cross is that is we're all in need of a Savior. And no matter what the number of our sins, or no matter how strong or how bad or how good we think we are, uh, how extreme or how extreme the world thinks our sins are, we're all saved in the same way. It's the gospel of Jesus. I think I realized that at an early age that uh, sharing the gospel is a pretty important part of being a Christian. I had this uncle, my dad's brother, his name is Adrian, interesting guy, road salesman, something I swore I would never ever be and that I've been for the last 40 years. Uh, he said, he used to tell me stories when I was little of how he would pick up hitchhikers. You could do that back then. And, and uh, he would work the conversation around to Jesus. And then he'd share the gospel. And he told me he'd leave the house in the morning and just pray about, Lord, where can you put me today? Where can put somebody in my path that I can share with today? And he would leave planning to pick up people. Can you imagine doing that today in this day and time? It's a scary thought, picking up people on the side of the road. But he did, and years later, after I was grown, I flew to Dallas and, and spent a weekend with him just to spend a little time and catch up, and uh, we began chatting about some of those stories he used to tell me, and he told me more, and he opened his Bible to the book of Romans, and the pages in it were just black from where they had put their hands and where he had, had shared his faith with, with other believers, and they had prayed to, I mean, with unbelievers, and they had prayed together. And uh, he said, Bobby, I guess I've seen a couple of thousand men come to Christ in the passenger seat of my car. But what a legacy to leave. And I never forgot that. When I was about 19, I was just sure that God was calling me to preach. And so I got some scholarship money together. My parents didn't have a lot of, a lot of funds. And uh, I went away to study at Union University, and I majored in religion. 
And I studied some, and I didn't study some. I did okay. But while I was there, it just seemed to become plain to me, or it, it, I just, I've lost all sense of direction. I did not feel that calling. And it was strange because it had just felt so strong at the time. But after much soul searching and praying, the Lord made it plain to me, this is not about your vocation. I want your heart. I want your obedience. And I finally realized that he was calling me not to preach, but to obedient. And I think uh, by the end of this service, you'll all agree that was one of my better decisions. About that time, God was also gracious enough to introduce me to my, what I now call my cellmate for life. And uh, we've been married for 47 years. We have a fine young daughter and wonderful son-in-law and, and a fine young Christian granddaughter. And some of you already know that for most of my career, I've been involved in the sales of law enforcement equipment. For the last 20 years, I've, had, or I've owned a manufacturer's sales rep agency. And we've sold body armor and tactical gear, duty gear, uh, bulletproof vests, if you'd rather call them that, um, tactical eyewear, firearms training systems, all types of things. And I, I got really close to some police officers. I never was one. But I got close to a lot of police officers, and I could see that their lives were just, they just had a tough time, personally, and of course on the job as well, and it's even worse today. And I'd always heard, grow where you're planted. And a few years back, I began to pray about how I could serve in this, in this area that I worked. And the Lord planted this idea of putting uh, together a, a New Testament ministry and providing New Testaments to police officers. I did some research, and I found this little NIV. Uh, it's called the Peacemaker's New Testament. It has some testimonies of police officers in it for police officers and uh, uh, some different stories in it for them, and it, it, it went over very well. I began to hand these out on a one-to-one on -one basis in my daily job and, and, uh, and leaving some behind at some small police departments, and I had some great experiences doing that. Uh, I wish I had time to go into some of them. When you see a police officer cry, you know, you know you've hit a hot spot. And, and uh, it, it's a great ministry. And, and I pray that someone keeps those things going today with them. But as I went forward, for some reason, I felt led to uh, take this into the prison ministry. And I had formed this little 501c3 uh, because I, I got asked to pass them out at conferences and meetings and it kind of outgrew my pocketbook. I formed a 501c3 so I could accept donations and it's called APB Ministries. I thought that was pretty clever. Uh, All Points Bible Ministries and it meant when we put out an APB we were putting a, a Bible in a police officer's hands. So I did that for a couple of years and like I said I, I just felt led to take this into the prison ministry. I didn't know why because that was a strange thought for me. Most of my life, my young adult life and a lot of my uh, older life, I was just terrified of the thought of going to prison. I had nightmares about it. And I just wake up with chills about, with those. And, and, um, but anyway, I was thinking I might put something together like that in retirement. Began to pray about it. And I was also thinking of selling my business. And I'm still pond I was still pondering that idea when late last fall, I saw this guy here on Facebook. And he was going to Jacksonville, Florida for uh, something called a Behind the Walls event, a Bill Glass Behind the Walls event. For you newer folks that don't know Rick White, uh, when Mark Gregory retired, the leadership team was tasked with uh, finding an interim pastor. And as part of the team, I got with some of the guys. And, and we had three or four prospects in mind. And I said, I know somebody that might uh, help us out, might direct us to someone, might point us in the right direction. And Rick had been pastor of the People's Church for over 30 years. And he was our personal pastor. He had baptized our granddaughter. And I kept up with him on Facebook, even though I hadn't seen him in a number of years. We had moved away from there. It probably been 20 years. But I kept up word of mouth and on Facebook. And I called him one day out of the blue. And I told him uh, what was going on, what we were thinking about. And he said, well, Bobby, I'd be interested in that job. And I was a little shocked at that. Uh, I went back and told the leadership team. We all quickly agreed that we'd reach out to those three guys that we had talked to and tell them that we'd found someone. So we were pleased to get someone as, as, uh, as good as Rick. And Rick was our interim pastor for about, or interim preacher, I'll say, for about seven or eight months. And uh, we kept in touch after he left here. 
And when I saw this post that I mentioned on this Facebook page, I texted him and I said, call me, Rick, and when you get back and tell me about this ministry that you're involved in. So he did, and he told me he was on staff there. Why was I not surprised? I don't know. Uh, he was a director of church relations and platform guests. And I told him I was in the process of selling my company. I wanted to find something I could do part-time, and I thought, well, maybe I could volunteer some of this ministry. He said, well, I'll put somebody in touch with you. I know a guy that handles that area, and uh, I'll have him reach out to you, and, and you might can volunteer some if you're interested. I said, great. So about three weeks went by, and he calls me, and he said, Bobby, I was talking to the CEO of our ministry, a guy named Michael Nolan, and he said, Michael asked me if I knew someone that might be interested in being a regional director uh, for our ministry. And he said, I told him, as a matter of fact, I do. So retirement didn't happen. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I have not worked as hard in years. But it's a good work. It's a fulfilling work. Uh, Rick likes to say, we're tired, but it's a good tired. And I agree with him. I keep saying, I can't believe I, I get to do this. And I get paid for it, too. So... It's a wonderful ministry. Bill Glass passed away in December. I never got the chance to meet him. Do any of you by chance remember Bill Glass, who he was? He was a pretty big deal in pro football. Ben does. Okay. He was a big deal in pro football, and he played for the Cleveland Browns. Uh, I'm going to play a short video of someone you will know, and he'll tell you a little bit about Bill Glass. You know, last New Year's Day, I sat in the Orange Bowl, that evening and saw Texas and Alabama fight it out. And I was taken by two of my beloved friends, the McDonald's down in Miami, Florida. And uh, I happened to sit in the box with a young man, a remarkable young man by the name of Art Modoff. He is the owner of the Cleveland Browns. Six months later, I was preaching in the Orange Bowl to the Baptist World Alliance. I sat beside the great defensive end of the Cleveland Browns, who are this year the great world champions. I sat beside Bill Glass. And I heard that night Bill Glass tell what Christ had done for him. And I asked Bill if he would be willing to come to Cleveland, I mean to Denver from Cleveland. And he said, well, if my boss will let me. Because last, yesterday rather, Bill played against the Detroit Lions. It was nationally televised. And for the last three years, he's played in the Pro Bowl, which is the all-star of pro football. And for three years, he played for Baylor University and was All-American. And he's one of the greatest football players in American today. And I want Bill Glass to come and tell us what Christ means to him. Bill, we're delighted to have you. He flew especially out here from that game yesterday in Detroit. You know, all over America, Well, that's Bill Glass. He's a pretty big deal in the NFL, and, and, and he traveled with Billy for quite a while, I think. And Dr. Graham asked him at one time, I had heard, to consider taking over this ministry for him because he was very sick. But apparently he got a lot better, and uh, Bill says, well, what should I do? And he said, well, why don't you start your own ministry? And he talked him into doing just that. And in 1969, he founded the Bill Glass Evangelistic Association. And one of his board members kept urging him to go into prisons. He said, no, I don't think I can do that. I just don't feel like I'd fit in in prisons. But they kept urging him, and he finally, he said he went in. He said, I was thrown into it kicking and screaming, but the response from the inmates was just unbelievable. And today this ministry is known as the Bill Glass Behind the Walls. We have a dedicated staff in Dallas, Texas, and we have thousands of teammates around the country that go into these events with us. When people hear about us, when they first hear about us, they think we're a prison ministry. And I'll probably shock you when I tell you we are not. That is a side effect of what happens from what we do. We are actually 
an evangelism training ministry. You heard the statistics on that first video there, but it's a very sad fact that probably 95% of church members have never shared or told anyone about Jesus. And only 2 or 3% do that on a regular basis. So our real mission is to come alongside the local church and we train its members to share their faith in Jesus with the least of these. We teach them to be fishers of men and we do that by taking them into what Bill Glass called the greatest fishing holes in America and that's prisons. And a wonderful side effect of that, if you want to put it that way, is that inmates get saved by the hundreds. God is so good. He has blessed our ministry. But these teammates we recruit they help us uh, put these events together. We meet with prisons first and wardens, and we'll plan an event months out, hopefully six, eight, 10, 12 months out. It takes a while to put these together, and we recruit teammates from local churches in those areas around the prison. And they help with hospitality. Uh, they help us uh, put meals together at church for our training that night. They help us uh, raise funds. These things don't happen for free. Uh, they help us with transportation, picking up our platform guests and our staff members, etc. And the night before an event, we hold what we call our Equip and Ignite. And we bring them into the host church near the prison, and we have a time of worship. We provide a meal for them, or someone provides a meal for them. And we teach them the do's, of don'ts, the do's and don'ts of going into prison. Uh, what to wear, what not to wear, what you can say, what you can't say. Uh, what will happen when we go through and process, and secure, process through security. And we teach them to share the gospel. And we do that using our own track. It's the Bill Glass track. It's called What Do You Think? And if you've ever been through the, the evangelism course, Share Jesus Without Fear, you'll find that it's a very similar track. And we elaborated on that a little bit. But it is the pure gospel. And we make sure that everyone sticks to that track so that we're all saying the same thing. And these inmates are hearing the gospel of Jesus, and that's the only thing that they're hearing. Next day, we hold what we call a Day of Champions, uh, conducted inside the prisons. And we bring in platform guests. We bring in, you saw the video, we bring in pro, pro athletes. Uh, we'll bring in weightlifters, magicians, tightrope walkers, uh, comedians, country music singers. We'll bring in motorcycles. We have teammates that come in, we'll ride their motorcycles in. And we, uh, we've even brought in race cars, and we'll rev these things up. Anything we can do to draw these prisoners out into the yard for a message of hope. And they do come out, and they do listen. And we'll take anyone from 40 to anywhere from 40 to 100 or more volunteers behind the walls. The platform guests will perform, and then one of them will close with a short message or testimony. It might say something like, you know, it may look like we've got our act together up here but it hasn't always been like that and they'll tell of a story that they went have gone through some of them are, are uh, ex-offenders themselves and they'll tell the story of how Jesus changed their lives and then they'll ask if anyone is interested in talking to one of our volunteers about a message of hope and I'm always amazed the hands just go up and and they just start coming to our volunteers it's I'm sure you've seen some of the results on on uh, Facebook that I've posted here on our church Facebook page, but it, it's, it's always surprising to me. It's like those Billy Graham crusades where you just started to see the people pour down the aisles. They're always ready. You see, every life in prison is a life in crisis, and they want to hear a message of hope. Yesterday, we were talking about the number of, of uh, I said you've seen some of the posts I've put on Facebook. Yesterday, some of my uh, compadres around the country, the other directors, put together events in Texas and in Ohio. And I think we did three facilities in Ohio and one in Texas, and 156 men came to Christ yesterday from those events. <laughs> Isn't God just amazing? Well, my job is to try to help make those events happen all over the southeast. And my first event was in Tampa just a few months ago. It was in March. And I will never forget the feeling I had when they opened those gates. You see, we're already in there with the platform gates, uh, platform guests, and we bring in equipment and the microphones and everything, and we set up. And then they open the gates and let the inmates come out into the yard. And we greet them, smile, and shake hands. And it's just, uh, just try to make them glad that we're here and show them that we're glad they're, they're with us and listening to us. And, 
and um, I just wasn't prepared for it. All I could think of as I saw these men come out was that the, the fields are white for harvest. And uh, I didn't meet the men that I thought I would meet, the hardened criminals that I was thinking I would see in there. I met people like you and me. I met people who had made mistakes. We all make mistakes. I met people looking for hope. We all know people like that. The statistics in that first video you saw are actually outdated. In a little over 50 years of going into prisons, Bill started this ministry 54 years ago, in a little over 50 years of going into prisons, 60,000 volunteers have shared the gospel and nearly 1.5 inmates have given their lives to Christ. But the number is really much greater than that. Let me tell you why it is. When we take, say, 60, 40, 50, 60 volunteers into a prison, probably 10 or 15 of them are going to be rookies. They've never been into a prison before. And some of those are going to have never shared their faith before. And they're going to have the opportunity to do that with four or five inmates that day. And because the results are always so great, God is moving in these events, most likely they're going to lead someone to Christ. And when they come out, they're just never the same. I can tell you my life has been changed by these events. And they'll continue to share, and people continue to hear the gospel. <clears throat> and unbelievers continue to come to Christ. But let me tell you another reason why that number is much larger. This is a story that I've heard two or three times. Our CEO has shared it, and I recently asked him to give me the details of it so I could share it with you guys. He said he was having lunch with one of our teammates a while back, a fellow by the name of Jim Buffington. And he said, Jim, why did you choose Bill Glass Behind the Walls? Why, why that ministry? Why this ministry? And, and Jim said, you know, I, Michael, I've been to a few of these events, and I always went with my friend Joel. We'd served together. And one day Joel called me and he said, Jim, there's a, a Bill Glass event coming up. Why don't we go? He said, at the time, I had some things going on in my life, and I wasn't sure I wanted to go, but I did. I agreed to go with him, and the night of the training, what I was telling you we call our equip and ignite training, I told Joel, let's go over and sit by the side by ourselves. I really don't feel very sociable, and they did, but one of our happy teammates walked over to them and, and started chatting them up, and he said, hi, my name's Jim Buffington, and this is my friend Joel, and the gentleman said, Jim Buffington. I used to know a James Buffington. And Jim said, well, uh, my father's name was James. He said, this is probably not your father. This was in Texas. He said, well, actually, I grew up in Texas. That's where we lived when I was younger. And the guy said, well, I doubt this is your father, though. He said, this man had been in prison, and he'd done some pretty bad things. And Jim said, I stopped and told him. He said, when I was a child, my father put out a contract on my mother, my two siblings, and myself. And he said, my two siblings and I escaped, but my mother did not. My father went to prison, and I never heard from him again. He said the guy was silent for a few seconds, and he looked at him, and he said, Jim, I was your father's cellmate for eight years, and he led me to Christ. He said he died in prison. He said, I went to the service, and when he did, no less than 300 men came forward and told them that his father had either led them to Christ or discipled them while he was in prison. It's an amazing story. I don't want us to overlook one thing. I don't know the name of the man who led James Buffington to Christ. I guess it really doesn't matter. One person was obedient to introduce one person to introduce someone to the Lord and that resulted in changed lives for hundreds of men we have no idea what the impact of one, one life led to Christ can make I want to read you a scripture and this is from the second chapter of Revelation Jesus had told John to write a letter to the seven churches and this one is to Ephesus and we know from Steve's study that Ephesus was a bustling seaport. It was also uh... <laughs> that's not mine. 
It was a bustling seaport, and it was also the capital of the Roman province of Asia. Paul had evangelized it, and both Timothy and John had served there. And this is what he told them to write. I don't know if, can we get the verse back up? No, if not, I will read it for you. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. And I know you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the good work you did at first. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Some translations, I think, say you've lost your early love. When we're first saved or, or come back from camp or a mission trip or whatever, we've got this zeal from that mountaintop we've been on. And sometimes we lose that zeal and we fail to tell people the hope that we have within us. We wax cold over a period of time. Lack of zeal is one reason that we don't share our faith, but there are other reasons. I want to share a few with you now uh, that I think all of us are affected by. I, I know I have been over the years. One is the lack of gospel knowledge. Or I want to say it's the perceived lack of gospel knowledge. Uh, we think we don't know enough. But the fact is we probably know too much. If you've been a Christian very long or been in church very long, you know you've heard the gospel story over and over again, hundreds of times probably, a sermon or a book. And we have all these verses jumbled up in our heads, and sometimes we're afraid we can't verbalize them. We can't get them added in order. I just don't know how to say it the right way. The fact is, we don't have to have a lot of memorized verses. Everyone in here, I bet, knows John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And you just have to, you can use that verse, and if you just have to know one more, uh, this one's a short one that we can use. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's simply Jesus is the only way, and he died for our sins. That's it. And then we tell our story. And we all have one if we're believers. Um, you know, Jesus told the story of, of or, the, or, the, or the gospel tells us the story of Jesus healing the blind man, and he put clay on his eyes, if you recall. And the Pharisees heard about it, and they were not happy. And they went to the blind man, and they asked him what happened. And, and he told them, and they were not happy with that. <laughs> so they went to his parents, asked him, them, is this your son that was blind? And, and they don't want to get involved, so they say, he's of age. Why don't you go ask him? So they go back to him and ask him again. And he says, whether he was a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. And that's our story, isn't it? I used to be that way. Now I'm this way. That's all we have to do is just share our story. I think another reason we don't is that it's for fear of rejection. We're afraid that our friends will be angry at us or upset with us or we might uh, hurt one of their feelings by sharing Christ with them. But the fact is that if they're our friends, we're not going to. Uh, in fact, they probably would love to hear about what excites you so much, surely they would want to know about the, the hope that you have inside of you. So I don't think that's a very good excuse either. And then there's this one. The timing just isn't right. I know that one has been one that I've used. Uh, we can wait and we can wait, but the timing is never going to be right. I doubt that our friend is ever going to come up to us and say, hey, Bobby, why don't you tell me about this Christian belief you've got? <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. So we don't need to wait any longer. Uh, the Bible tells us, it says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I read something recently by David Platt. A pretty strong statement. It says, Apathy may be as big an obstacle to evangelism as atheism. Boy, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? I don't want to stand up here and tell you that I've always shared my faith that I've been evangelizing my whole life, that, that would not be true. Uh, but I don't believe I've ever reached the point of apathy. 
I have at times been complacent. And I know this. A complacent Christian is of little use when it comes to leading others to Jesus. And I think that's a large reason why 95% of us fail to share our faith. I want to tell you a little story that happened to me several years back. I popped into this restaurant. I think I was going in to get takeout dinner, to bring home for dinner. And there was a guy sitting at one of the tables, and he was counting out his change. And I could see that he was probably trying to figure out if he had enough to eat. Uh, I could see by the backpack beside him that it probably contained most of his worldly goods. I also could see that something wasn't quite right with him. And I didn't know quite what to do, and I just walked out the door. I got about halfway to the car. I turned around and went back inside and I walked up to him and I said, friend, are you short on eating money? He nodded that he was. And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out a $10 bill and I gave it to him. And he smiled and said, thank you or God bless or something to that effect. And I went on back to my car and drove home. I don't know why this affected me so much because I had missed opportunities before, but later that evening, a thought kept running through my head, and it was loud and clear. Why didn't you tell that man about Jesus? And I had all of these excuses that I just talked about uh, running through my mind. It didn't seem like it was the right time. Uh, He didn't seem like he was quite right. I think he might have been drinking. Uh, None of those excuses were any good. And I agonized about it all night. Quite frankly, I didn't sleep very much. And the next morning in my Bible study, I had been studying the book of Esther. And I looked down at this verse. And, and I, if, you've, if you know the book of Esther, I, I, not, I don't have time to go through the whole lesson. But what a wonderful story it is. But Mordecai is telling Esther that she needs to talk to the king on behalf of the Jews. And he says, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time of this, as this. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And to be honest, it brought me to tears. And I prayed about it, and I asked forgiveness, and I determined in my mind (laughs) that I was going to go back to that restaurant that night, and I was going to share Christ with that guy if he was here. I was hoping he'd be back in the same place. But I got there, and of course he wasn't there. And I got into my car to go home, and the sun was in my eyes, so I lowered the sun visor. And a $10 bill floated down into my lap. And it was like God said to me, I don't need your money, Bobby. But once again, I heard, what I want is your heart. I want your obedience. Sometimes we just need a little reminder of, where we're suppo- of, where, of how we're supposed to be and when we're supposed to be at a certain place.